Hey guys, today we're taking a look at my finished build of the Lager Zero Gusaku Miyoko from my channel sponsor 2Toys. Two 2Toys Two makes a resin conversion kit for the Kotobukiya Lager Zero to turn it into this version from Zoid's Generations and I've already done two previous videos reviewing the kit and showing how to prep it for painting if you want to check those out. There's also a link in the description for you to buy one of these with a discount code. Anyway, now that I'm finally done, I'm going to do my usual show and tell where I talk about what paints I used and how, I'll show you how to attach the resin parts to the Kotobukiya kit, and then of course I've got some pictures at the end as well. Let's get started. RoboShop All right, let's start with the boring stuff. Uh, this isn't really what we're here for. Let's take a look at the inner frame first. Uh, I did what I pretty much always do and uh, just, you know, painted this uh, mostly gunmetal. So the way that that works is you start with um, this primer here from Vallejo. This is their uh, gloss black primer that they specifically make for their um, metallic paints. Over that, um, I sprayed mostly uh, gunmetal gray here. That's this color. All of these parts here uh, that either came in this weird minty color that um, uh, Kotobukiya was fond of using for a while are also the brown parts, which are even more puzzling in my opinion. Uh, they were all done with uh, my favorite silver color, which is pure aluminium. It's just a very bright silver that really pops against everything else. Uh, and then once that's done, a uh, thorough, very sloppy dry brushing with uh, Tamiya Chrome Silver here. Probably the best silver dry brush paint in the world, in my opinion. Um, and then a little bit with this red brown. Um, and what that gives you is this sort of really beat up and slightly uh, rusty looking appearance. Um, the caps were done with uh, uh, corn red here from Citadel, um, but I went so heavy with the wash on these afterwards that uh, they look almost black now. It's probably the one thing that I'm not entirely happy with. They should have been brighter. Uh, but yeah, speaking of, there is a wash of uh, MIG black wash uh, on these, which I also used for the pin wash on the armor pieces. Um, this is a really nice enamel wash, but you do have to thin it down a lot. Don't think you can, this looks like it's meant to just, you know, stick, uh, you can just stick your brush in it, but uh, you want to thin this for it to work properly. And uh, the gold parts, um, like these uh, pistons here and the claws, uh, were done with uh, titanium gold from Tamiya. Uh, this is a very sort of pale champagne-ish looking gold color. And so what I did afterwards is that I uh, slapped a wash of Reichland Flesh Shade from Citadel over it. As you can see, I mean, this is obviously it's called Flesh Shade. It's sort of a flesh colored uh, paint and uh, it's it works really well to just make uh, gold colors look a bit richer uh, I actually use it a lot more for that than I use it for um, for actual flesh tones and uh, I think that's it um, the uh, translucent part for the eye here is uh, sprayed tour aluminium and black on the inside uh, to make it a bit more reflective. It's not translucent anymore now, of course, but uh, that's what that does. And also, uh, on the inside of the mouth here, I painted this. You probably can't even see this on camera. This is all gold, same color as the teeth, and uh, looks a bit wonky, to be honest. Um, yeah, and that's it. Uh, we are going to talk about what I used for all these armor parts in a second when we get around to the actual armor. And here are all the armor pieces. Uh, this is all the extra stuff that you get with the uh, with the two toys kit, with the exception of the sword, because 
uh, to be honest with you, the sword isn't done yet. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm filming this just as I'm finishing up work on the sword. A, because I need to get this video done, and B, because I honestly I can't wait anymore. I've got to see this thing put together. So what did I do here? Um, as you can see, uh, this is all done in this sort of bluish gray or grayish blue color. Um, and uh, the way I did that was I start with a prime of uh, ultimate primer gray. Um, this is sort of my, my go-to these days, especially if I'm going to do pre-shading, which I then did with uh, Tamiya XF1 uh, flat black. Um, the pre-shading is, you can see this, you know, here along the edges and uh, did a lot of pre-shading on the shield here, here, everywhere. Um, and then I sprayed over all of that um, with uh, Tamiya Light Blue here. Um, it's called Light Blue, but as you can see, it, it doesn't really come out like what you'd expect when you look at a jar of paint that says Light Blue on it. It's almost gray. Um, that's all I did with the airbrush, um, except for the top coating. Um, after that, I did all of the black trim here um, with uh, everyone's least favorite black color to hand brush uh, Citadel Baton Black. I don't know why everybody hates this paint so much. It works fine for me. Um, and all of the red accents uh, are done with uh, Corn Red, um, also a favorite color of mine. Um, and, uh, yeah, then a couple of metallic things, but that's really it. Uh, I'd like to just, uh, maybe briefly talk about sort of, uh, the choices I made, but, uh, it's really, I mean, it's not hard to figure out what I did here. Basically, the idea was to do, you know, uh, bluish gray with black trim. Um, and then, oh yeah, also, um, I did two pin washes, um, black on all of the gray parts, uh, again with the, uh, MIG wash. And on all of the black parts, here's probably where you can see that best. You see these panel lines here. That's uh, also MIG dark gray, which uh, of course still shows up fine against pure black. Um, yeah, and then I just decided to do uh, to do gray with a black trim basically, and I did the corn red because I wanted to have sort of one collar flourish on there. You know, this, this weird string thing here. Uh, all of these little I don't know what these are, but basically I painted them all red <laughs> here on the head armor as well. And uh, these straps for these straps here for these pieces. Um, and um, yeah, that was pretty much it. Uh, it was time consuming enough as it was. Um, the uh, final thing I did after I, uh, well, after I had done all of that, I gloss coated it. Uh, then I did the pin wash. Uh, then I put a matte coat, also from Tamiya, all over everything. Uh, and then after the final matte coat, uh, I painted all of these metallic parts, like the blade here on the tail, all these bolts that you find uh, all over everything here, uh, this piston, and also everywhere, um, everywhere where there was a grill, uh, like this, for example. Um, and uh, those I just left. They don't have top coat on them. Uh, I figured, you know, it, these aren't, I'm never going to touch these sections again. And this way I have a bit of a metallic uh, against matte contrast on these armor pieces, which are very much sort of monolithic, you know, there's no, I mean, I could have granted, I mean, these pieces here, for example, I could have painted separately and then inserted. Uh, so there is some part separation, but for the most part, uh, if you want to have some color variety, you have to do it yourself, uh, either by masking um, or uh, or by uh, just hand painting everything, which in my opinion came out fine. Really, I first of all, I just I hate masking, <laughs> and uh, and also uh, the other reason I did it this way is because I just I've had so much practice pa uh, painting Warhammer minis 
that I know I can pull it off. Is it going to be perfect? No, but guess what? When you do masking, there are always mistakes as well. There's always some, and then I don't know. I, I often find like when you, you know, when you have like a sharp line where the masking tape just wasn't exactly where it's supposed to be, that almost looks worse. Anyway, uh, that's really all I wanted to talk about here. Um, what I'm going to do next now is I'm going to actually show you guys how to assemble this. Uh, I've seen a lot of photos of this kit, but nobody's ever actually shown how it goes together. So I decided um, that's what I was going to do in this video. And it's probably going to go horribly wrong. Uh, before we do that though, uh, <laughs> I can't believe I actually forgot to talk about the weathering. You know my favorite thing about building and painting model kits. Um, what I also did, of course, and you can see this uh, on this um, on this leg armor piece here, is I did all this chipping here and also some dry brush soot. Uh, the chipping was done with uh, on the on the gray areas uh, first with administratum gray, and I, I actually brush my chipping on these days. I've pretty much stopped doing sponge chipping altogether. Uh, and then I did some deeper chips within those lighter chips with. Uh, Dry at bark, also from Citadel, and on the uh, on the black parts, I used uh, Mechanicus Standard Gray. Um, you can see it a little here, uh, and also brown uh, Dry at bark for a little bit of a rust spot on the inside. Um, and then I also did some oil streaking, which you can see here, for example. I went relatively light with the. Um, uh, with the weathering this time and I used, uh, this is Aptilong 502 light rust and it says that somewhere on the tube here, you're just gonna have to take my word for it. Um, and uh, dirt streaking and also this uh, dry brushed soot here um, around these um, jet exhausts I did with uh, Starship Filth. Uh, the streaking these days I actually do with fairly thin uh, oil paint, basically at a wash consistency. Uh, and then just, honestly, I can't even tell you a process anymore. I just slop it around until it looks the way I like. Sometimes wet, uh, sometimes the brush is almost dry, and uh, sometimes I find a little chunk of oil paint in there, and I dab it on there, and I dry brush it around. And actually, you know, not having all these streaks look exactly the same uh, actually helps the overall appearance of the piece, I think. Yeah, so much for the weathering. Let's do assembly. Uh, anyway, here is uh, a hind leg. Let's start with these. Now what you have here is this peg hole right here. And uh, the last time I test fitted this, everything fit fine. The armor pieces have a, have a peg here. And here you can also see I didn't properly paint them on the inside, but no use in doing that. Um, yeah, and you really just stick it on that peg and that fits just fine. Um, same thing with the other hind leg, uh, like so, except this one doesn't want to go in, okay, now it's, now it's flush, um, that's looking good, um, what else we got on the torso, this uh, replaces the boosters, right? And now this, I remember, was a bit of a tight fit. Um, and kind of what I, I mean, you've got these three pegs and they're supposed to go in these three peg holes. So it's not rocket surgery, you know, but as you can see, it's just maybe a tiny bit long and uh, you have to kind of coax it into place. And here we go. Sorry about that jump cut, folks, but um, the uh, basically the trick is to put the front peg in first and then push a little against it. But uh, this is probably going to be different um, on other people's kits because it's just a slight mis uh, misalignment of the parts probably due to the casting. Anyway, uh, let's continue um, with uh, the front legs. Uh, this works the same way as on the hind legs. You have this peg hole here and a peg here. And this fits uh, perfectly, like so, nice and tight. Also don't need to glue this. By the way, the reason these legs are uh, bent in sort of various shapes is because I um, 
decided before I'd even started that this was going to be fixed pose uh, because I just cannot put myself through the agony of of painting every single one of these pieces separately only for them to you know um, basically like you, you pose it once uh, and then and then you never move it again anyway so I just decided on a pose and that's that's what the legs look like now these things with the straps here go on uh, go under <laughs> uh, these armor bits here for the um, uh, for the legs and uh, so I'm going to take this one off as well this one goes on here and pop there we go uh, and now the leg armor um, these are for the front legs and again peg here hole here everything works fine it's not complicated here we go see um, and this one on the other one here we go now uh, on the hind legs uh, first of all these uh, these little like booster intake pieces here they go on here um, also fit fine oops that one came off interesting let's put it on here and see if it sticks on this part because you know how that sometimes happens um, yeah and on this one it's a tight fit which reminds me I actually no um, this one on here yeah I'm gonna super glue this one uh, it's not super tight whoops comes off right again um, right anyway the uh, leg armor uh, goes on again you have peg holes here so it's nothing uh, nothing complicated or precarious or that you know could really go wrong in any way so here we go that's the leg armor in place um, also on this leg now this is going to be a little bit fiddly actually you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna pull this all the way out um, this is a gimmick that this kit has to allow for more mobility and mostly results in these stupid leg pieces falling apart all the time. Um, yeah, and now I can't get this one in there. Let's see here. Pull this out again. And uh, preferably... Okay, I'm going to have to bend this out a little. Eh, come on. Here we go. Bend this back. Like so. Okay, see that fits. Um, what else we got? The tail. Ooh, this is interesting. I, I did dry fit this, so hopefully. Well, here we go. It took a little bit of convincing, but uh, now it's in. Um, and finally, the head. Um, first of all, you need to you need to take these off. Um, and then this um, goes here. Um, they attach the same way as the uh, armor bits that originally came with the kit. These sort of side main things here. There we go. Um, right, here we go. Uh, that's these bits done. And uh, then we have, of course, uh, these armor pieces here. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I just realized something. I've got to put this on first. Now, this uh, head armor here is actually two pieces, and I haven't glued these together yet. And you're about to see why. Um, it's because uh, this part here... Um, has uh, a peg that fits into uh, the hole right here. And the best way to get this on is really to do it first because you kind of have to squeeze here 
um, for it to sit flush um, and then you wiggle it around a bit and then it'll go in um, and now see what I wanted to do is I wanted to make sure that I glue this together in a way where it's actually going to sit reasonably flush so I'm going to glue this on afterwards uh, and now uh, we can attach the um, these other armor bits now one quick note about these um, there's a peg hole here actually uh, and uh, right here you can see <laughs> there used to be a peg that I shaved off because honestly what happened was I put these together and you can see when I assemble it now um, the I mean I am really not sure what it is but this here this isn't even close to where it's supposed to be. I mean, it looks totally fine, right? Um, nothing wrong with what this looks like, uh, but but the pegs and the holes, just they don't line up at all. So I just got rid of them. I did have to fill up the hole there with milliput and sand, but as you can see, it came out pretty much perfect. So, uh, so that's fine. Uh, yeah, and uh, that's it. Um, I'm not going to do final assembly on camera because that's just going to be a lot of cursing. Has this been here the whole time? <laughs> um, this shield here, in case you were wondering, um, goes on this piece, like so. Um, and with this ball joint, I'm not going to put this in here though, because I want to put this, I want to attach this to the torso before I put the, uh, before I put the shield on. Uh, one last thing I forgot to mention, um, is that um, here you see this uh, this is meant to hold I think I actually still have the parts here yeah this is meant to hold this uh, which is basically the contraption that holds the sword um, but uh, I decided pretty early in the process that the, um, the I was going to put the sword in his mouth and this thing actually looks kind of wonky so I just left it off uh, yeah, that's it. So I'm gonna do final assembly and then we're gonna check it out in the photo booth. So first off, here's a comparison to the box standard unpainted Liger Zero. I've probably embarrassed myself by showing in about a dozen comparison pictures at this point. I think it's kind of interesting how much bulkier the Gusa Kumiyoko parts make it look. The common complaint about the Kotobukiya Liger Zero is that it looks too spindly, but the Gusa Kumiyoko version doesn't really have this problem. Anyway, that's really all I have to show you guys, so I'm just going to let the slideshow run while I give you my final thoughts on this build. Overall, I'm really happy with how it came out. I went through a lot of different ideas for the color scheme, and you know how you never really know whether it's going to work until you're done, right? Honestly, this is one of those rare cases where the end result looks more or less exactly like what I had imagined. It's a bit of a wacky design overall, so using a simple collar scheme with basically three collars and all relatively muted really helps it to, I don't know, I don't want to say grounded in reality because it's still a giant robot cat with samurai armor, but it ties it all together, I think. I also really like how the pre-shading came out, which was the main reason why I didn't do a dot filter this time so that I wouldn't lose that contrast. What I'm personally really not entirely satisfied with is the job I did cleaning up the parts. I really thought I had been pretty thorough, but once I started priming and painting, I noticed a lot of mold lines and smaller air bubbles that I had missed. I don't think it really hurts the overall impression of the build, but I already have another Liger casket from Two Toys to review and build, and I've resolved to be a bit more careful with that one. And uh, yeah, that's all I have to say really, but I've got more pictures for you guys, so enjoy!
Well, and that's it for this one, folks. I'd like to thank Two Toys for sending me this kit to review and build, and if you want to get one for yourself, again, you can use the link in the description for a coupon code and a discount. Two Toys also has a lot of other cool stuff related to Zoids and other properties that you're really going to want to check out. As for what's next around here, I've actually been sitting on the AZ Murasami Liger for half an eternity, so I'm definitely reviewing that next, and then we'll see. What I can tell you is that I'm not doing the Lager Zero Phoenix, but you better believe I've already pre-ordered multiple copies of the AZ Death Sorrow that's coming out at the end of the year. But in the meantime, I'll probably actually do some proper painted builds and talk about those, or at least that's what I'd like to do. Anyway, thank you for watching this all the way to the end. Give the video a like and subscribe as well if you like Zoids and Mecha in general. Support me on Patreon or with a PayPal donation if you like my stuff, and I'll see you in the next one.